This is section seventy eight of newspaper articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper articles by Mark Twain, section seventy eight, Alta California, April ninth, eighteen sixty seven. Alta California, April ninth, eighteen sixty seven. New York, March second, eighteen sixty seven. Grand European pleasure trip. Prominent Brooklynites are getting up a great European pleasure excursion for the coming summer, which promises a vast amount of enjoyment for a very reasonable outlay. The passenger list is filling up pretty fast. The steamer to be used will be fitted up comfortably and supplied with a library, musical instruments, and a printing press, for a small daily paper is to be printed on board. The ship is to have ample accommodations for 150 cabin passengers, but in order that there may be no crowding, she will only carry 110. The steamer fare is fixed at $1,250 currency. The vessel will stop every day or two to let the passengers visit places of interest in the interior of the various countries, and this will involve an additional expense of about $500 in gold. The voyage will begin the 1st of June, and end near the beginning of November, five months, but may be extended by unanimous vote of the passengers. Outward bound, a day or two will be spent at Gibraltar, and about ten days at Marseilles, which latter will give an opportunity of looking in at the Paris fair. If desired, passengers may tarry longer at Paris, and then pass down through Switzerland and rejoin the ship at Genoa where she will remain ten days. From Genoa, excursions will be made to Milan, the lakes of Como and Maggiore, and to Verona, Padua, and Venice. Also the party may visit Parma, Bologna, and Florence, and rejoin the vessel at Leghorn. Pisa and Lucca can likewise be added to the program. From Leghorn to Naples, the route will be along the coast of Italy, close by Camprera, Elba, and Corsica, and arrangements have been made to pay Garibaldi a visit. Eight days will be spent at Naples, and visits will be made to Herculaneum, Pompeii, Vesuvius, Virgil's tomb, and the ruins of ancient Pestum. A day will next be spent at Palermo in Sicily, thence through the group of Aeolian Isles, in sight of the volcanoes of Stromboli and Volcania, through the Straits of Messina, with Scylla on the one hand and Charybdis on the other, along the east coast of Sicily and in sight of Mount Etna. Along the south coast of Italy, the west and south coast of Greece, in sight of ancient Crete, up Athens Gulf into the Piraeus, Athens will be reached. A day will be given to Corinth, and then the voyage will be extended through the Grecian archipelago, the Dardanelles, and the Sea of Marmara to Constantinople. After a day or two at the latter place, a sail through the Bosporus and across the Black Sea will bring the party to Sebastopol and Balaclava, thence back again and along the coasts of ancient Troy and Lydia in Asia to Smyrna, from which point Ephesus will be visited. The steamer will stop at Beirut and time allowed to visit Damascus, and then proceed to Joppa and remain there ten or twelve days so that the passengers can go to Jericho, I mean to Jerusalem, and to the other side of Jordan, the Sea of Tiberias, Nazareth, Bethany, Bethlehem, and other points of interest in the Holy Land. A stop of four or five days will be made at Alexandria in Egypt, and the ruins of Caesar's Palace, Pompey's Pillar, Cleopatra's Needle, the Catacombs, the site of ancient Memphis, Joseph's Granaries, and the Pyramids. They don't go to Cairo, but I do not mind that, because I have been to Cairo once, in Illinois, and that was enough for the subscriber. In the remainder of the program I find mention of such points as Malta, Cagliari in Sardinia, Palma in Majorca, Valencia in Spain, Alicant, Carthagena, Palos, Malaga, Madeira, the Peak of Tenerife, the Bermudas, and so forth and so on, to the crack of doom. A man may stay aboard the ship all the time he wants to. It is essentially a pleasure excursion, and so private caprices will be allowed full scope. Isn't it a most attractive scheme? 
five months of utter freedom from care and anxiety of every kind and in company with a set of people who will go only to enjoy themselves and will never mention a word about business during the whole voyage it is very pleasant to contemplate reverend mr twain i started down with a tribune man to make some inquiries about this trip we met a friend and he said it was a very stylish affair was not gotten up for a speculation it was not intended that its projectors should make any money out of it and that the character and standing of every applicant for passage had to undergo the strictest assay by a committee before his money would be received and his name booked this was an appalling state of affairs however we went on and were received at the office of the concern with that distant politeness proper toward men who travel muddy streets on foot go unshaven and carry countenances like like ours for instance my friend smith for short said i suppose you are the chief officer of the european pleasure excursion sir we have called to make some inquiries about it allow me to introduce the rev mark twain who is a clergyman of some distinction lately arrived from san francisco i am glad to meet you sir be seated gentlemen twain twain oh you probably have not heard of me i have latterly been in the missionary business smith interrupting oh devil take it don't use those villainous slang expressions you'll expose everything and then he said aloud yes he has been a missionary to the sandwich islands during a part of the last year but officiating in the open air has injured his health and and my congregation concluded to start me out traveling for my health i would like to take some stock i mean i would like to ship uh, that is book my name for this pleasure trip i hear that mr beecher is going is that so the reply was affirmative and then smith said we felt some solicitude about that because my friend would naturally like to take part in the services on board and we feared that possibly mr beecher might not be willing to permit ministers of other denominations to do any of the preaching i said with a show of humility yes that's it i am only a baptist you see but i'd like to have a show oh damn it smith whispered you'll ruin everything with that slang then aloud yes my friend is a baptist clergyman and we feared that inasmuch as mr beecher is a universalist he universalist why he is a congregationalist but never mind that i have no doubt he would be sincerely glad to have mr twain assist him in the vessel's pulpit at all times no doubt in the world about that i had to laugh out strong here i could not well help it the idea of my preaching time about with beecher was so fresh so entertaining so delightful however smith said now you are laughing again at that same old occurrence up the street well it was funny this saved us from exposure and i sat there and said no more but listened to instructive remarks about my missionary services and my baptist congregation in san francisco till the misery of trying to keep from laughing was unbearable and we left i went back yesterday with another friend acknowledged my true occupation entered my name for the voyage and paid the forfeit money required to secure a berth the remainder of the one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars is not to be paid until the fifteenth of april when all such accounts have to be squared i also left references as to my high moral character for that committee to chaw on as brown expressed it and i do not envy them the job they have got about all they can attend to for the next six weeks to get up a spotless character for me if they succeed i will get a copy of it and have it framed among others i referred to rev mr damon of honolulu and it lies heavy on my conscience because i stole a book from him which i have not returned yet for my other references i chose men of bad character in order that my mild virtues might shine luminously by contrast with their depravity there was sagacity in the idea i expect to go on this excursion to the holy land and the chief countries of europe provided i receive no vetoing orders from the alta and against all such i fervently protest beforehand no veto he has been telegraphed to go ahead eds alta how are the mighty fallen 
now that barnum is running for congress anything connected with him is imbued with a new interest therefore i went to his museum yesterday along with the other children there is little or nothing in the place worth seeing and yet how it draws it was crammed with both sexes and all ages one could keep on going upstairs from floor to floor and still find scarcely room to turn there are numerous trifling attractions there but if there was one grand absorbing feature i failed to find it there is a prodigious woman eight feet high and well proportioned but there was no one to stir her up and make her show her points so she sat down all the time and there is a giant also just her own size but he appeared to be sick with love for her and so he sat morosely on his platform in his astonishing military uniform and wrought no wonders if i was impresario of that menagerie i would make that couple prance around some or i would dock their rations two dwarfs unknown to fame and a speckled negro complete the list of human curiosities they profess to have a circassian girl there but i could not find her i think they have moved her out to make room for another peanut stand in fact barnum's museum is one vast peanut stand now with a few cases of dried frogs and other wonders scattered here and there to give variety to the thing you can't go anywhere without finding a peanut stand and an impudent negro sweeping up hulls when peanuts and candy are low they sell newspapers and photographs of the dwarfs and the giants there are some cages of ferocious lions and other wild beasts but they sleep all the time and also an automaton card-writer but something about it is broken and it don't go now also a good many bugs with pins stuck through them but the people do not seem to enjoy bugs any more there is a photograph gallery in one room and an oyster saloon in another and some news depots and soda fountains a pistol gallery and a raffling department for cheap jewelry but not any barber shop a plaster of paris statue of venus with little stacks of dust on her nose and her eyebrows stands neglected in a corner and in some large glass cases are some atrocious waxen images done in the very worst style of the art queen victoria is dressed in faded red velvet and glass jewelry and has a bloated countenance and a drunken leer in her eye that remind one of convivial mary holt when she used to come in from a spree to get her ticket for the county jail and that accursed eyesore to me tom thumb's wedding party which airs its smirking imbecility in every photograph album in america is not only set forth here in ghastly wax but repeated why does not some philanthropist burn the museum again the happy family remains but robbed of its ancient glory a poor spiritless old bear sixteen monkeys half a dozen sorrowful raccoons two mangy puppies two unhappy rabbits and two meek tomcats that have had half the hair snatched out of them by the monkeys compose the happy family and certainly it was the most subjugated looking party i ever saw the entire happy family is bossed and bullied by a monkey that any one of the victims could whip only that they lack the courage to try it he grabs a tomcat by the nape of the neck and bounces him on the ground he cuffs the rabbits and the coons and snatches his own tribe from end to end of the cage by the tail when the dinner tub is brought in he gets bodily into it and the other members of the family sit patiently around till his hunger is satisfied or steal a morsel and get bored heels over head for it the world is full of families as happy as that the boss monkey has even proceeded so far as to nip the tail short off of one of his brethren and now half the pleasures of the poor devil's life are denied him because he ain't got anything to hang by it almost moves one to tears to see that bob-tailed monkey work his stump and try to grab a beam with it that is a yard away and when his stump naturally misses fire and he falls none but the heartless can laugh why cannot he become a philosopher why cannot he console himself with the reflection that tales are but a delusion and a vanity at best barnum puts a play on his stage called the christian martyr 
and in the third act all the mules and lions and sheep and tigers and pet bulls and other ferocious wild animals are marched about the stage in grand procession preparatory to going through the christian in the final act they throw the christian into a cage with a couple of lions but they were asleep and all the punching the martyr could do and all the cursing he could get off under his breath failed to wake them but the ignorant roman populace on the stage took their indifference for providential interference and so they let the doomed christian slide barnum's lions prefer fresh beef to martyrs i suspect they are of the same breed as those we read of that were too stuck up to eat good old daniel barnum's show is not a very good one if he has no better show to get to congress he ought to draw out of the canvas the arabian nights repeated history repeats itself and so does romance there is something in the arabian nights if my memory serves me which is a little like the incident i am going to set down here with the difference that this is true and the story in the book was doubtless an invention two weeks ago a woman in great distress applied to a ladies benevolent society here for means to bury her husband they made due inquiry and then gave her the necessary amount of money one of these ladies had for a long time been praying to her heavenly father for a questionable blessing in the shape of a child and contracting that if her prayers were answered she would perform some deed of notable benevolence as a stand-off her prayers were answered in the most complimentary manner she had triplets she had triplets and naturally her husband shut down on her devotions but that has got nothing to do with my story she heard of this sorrowing woman and she thought it a good time to comply with her contract she went to the house of mourning and counted out one hundred dollars in greenbacks on the dead man's coffin and the weeping widow blessed her it is considered the fair thing here to pay praying debts in greenbacks the charitable lady had not been gone many minutes before she discovered she had left her gloves behind her she rushed back to the abode of death and found that infernal corpse sitting up in the coffin examining the greenbacks with a banknote reporter they plague the benevolent lady a good deal but she does not mind it in fact she is rather proud of raising the dead with a handful of greenbacks the great masquerade the grand bal d'opera came off at the new academy of music last night i suppose there may have been ten or twelve hundred people present but it was hard to make estimate in so large a building the great majority of both sexes wore neither masks nor fancy costumes and yet were allowed to come on the floor long before the hour for unmasking this had an embarrassing effect of course and consequently what should have been a hilarious carnival was a good deal more like a funeral for the first two hours i got myself up in flowing royal robes and purported to be a king of some country or other but i only felt like a highly ornamental butcher if everybody else felt as solemn and absurd as i did they have my sympathy i could not dance with any comfort because i was in danger of tripping in my petticoats and breaking my neck every moment and so i deserted soon and went to promenading in the broad halls in the rear of the balconies dukes and princes and queens and fairies met me at every turn and i might have managed to imagine myself in a land of enchantment but for remarks i was constantly overhearing for instance i heard joan of arc say she would give the world for a mess of raw oysters and martin luther said he didn't feel well because he had been playing poker for the last forty-eight hours the wandering jew chatted and laughed like a schoolgirl and vivacious charles the second was as dismal as an owl dukes and emperors called each other jim and joe and spoke in the most plebeian way of going out to take a drink i even heard the queen of the fairies say she wished she had some cheese these little things have a tendency to destroy the pleasant illusions created by deceptive costumes i did not feel happy at that ball but i never felt so particularly unhappy in my life as i do at this moment end of section seventy eight